Seminar three, we're going to take an even, even deeper dive. We're going to get into something that's probably one of the most controversial subjects in all of Bordeaux, and that's the classification system or lack thereof. Um, it seems fairly easy from about 30,000 feet to understand it. Um, here's the organization, here's the structure. You look at it, you memorize it, uh, you might make purchasing decisions based upon it, but it's far more complicated than that. There's a lot of business interests that went into the classification, and there's a lot of resistance to this classification, even to this day. And I'm speaking of one classification, because that seems to be the one that everybody talks about. And that's the 1855 classification of the duck. But there are others that we'll cover as well. So here we are, uh, again with our journey, the structure of Bordeaux. Whether we like it or not, it is in place. It is part of what Bordeaux is today. Um, and we cover this again. This is the size of Bordeaux, about the size of Rhode Island. Not huge, or half of Rhode Island. So again, not huge in terms of land mass, but in terms of the global scheme, this is the largest fine wine producing region in the world. So we're going to start with some leading questions just to get you thinking about how relevant is this? How much does this matter to my personal world and how much does it matter to the Commander Reef? How much does it matter to even the producers in Bordeaux? We want to talk about, you know, why does it exist? What, what's the proper basis? How, if we were going to start today, would we classify, you know, or how, how would we organize Bordeaux? Is what was done 150 years ago or 170 years ago the right way to still perceive Bordeaux today? Are these classification schemes that started in the last 50 years that seem to be in an tied up in endless lawsuits, is that the right way to go? Who's gonna be making the decisions? Who should be making this, I mean, really, you know, huge financial decision for an entire region, or an entire commune? Is it the IMAO? They seem to kind of have their finger in just about every single region. They certainly certify Grand Cru vineyards in Burgundy. Um, should they be part of this classification? Is it the BATF, you know, here in the United States? Should we be the ones kind of deciding, based upon our personal markets, what the classification, what the classification should be. You know, our dollars should do the dictating, right? Or is it the Deutsche Weinbombs? You know, it's, is, is it some organization that has a lot of money that maybe it's not, you know, akin or there's anything equivalent in France, but is it something where they're basically funding research, they're funding winery, um, you know, kind of classification and stratification? Is it should be Antonio Galloni? And that's a little tongue in cheek because maybe it shouldn't be him, but you know, you could put Robert Parker in there. You could put uh, Jeb Dunnick in there. Any one of these wine critics, are they going to be the ones that dictate how this structure of, again, the, the largest fine wine region in the world is organized? And how should this affect your personal you know, decisions on what should I buy? How am I going to maximize my dollars, not just for my own seller, but also for the commander? So here's the official stance. You can see it's some bureaucratic stuff. Um, ab absolutely, 100%, the government is behind this. It's important, it's critical, it's a reflection of history. Um, but here's the, here's the key part that I think a lot of people forget that if you're not classified, it doesn't mean your winery is not good. It doesn't mean your wine is not good. It doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing or not doing the right things. It emphasizes that your wine can still be delicious. And that's kind of the point of it all. We can't lose sight of that. It's certainly, we, we look at investment vehicles in the world of wine today. We look about making a sound investment that's going to not just accumulate value, accrue, uh, but it's also going to accumulate in flavor and accumulate in status and prestige. That being said, if we forget that it's supposed to be enjoyed, wine is by definition supposed to be a communal beverage. It's shared amongst people. I do find that 750 bottles are single serving, so you need more than one at least. But you know, if it's delicious, that's what matters. So here are the classifications listed in order seniority going from top to bottom. We start with the uh, classification of the duck, Grave, Saint Emilion, Cru Bourgeois, and Cru Artisan. And those last two might be something totally new to you because you have to kind of peel down a couple layers that are relatively recent in terms of being certified, ratified uh, classification schemes. Um, but you look back, these do have roots basically going back 60, 70 years in and of themselves. In fact, Cru Bourgeois, you could argue, is actually an extension of the 1855 Medoc that was never really formally certified, but was just as important because it then encompassed a lot of the people, a lot of the wineries that, quote, didn't make the cut. But there's a strong European role that was played with this classification scheme, starting with the British up to the 1500s. They married in. They basically received Aquitaine as a dowry um, from uh, Henry Plantagenet to Eleanor of Aquitaine. So Aquitaine became part of Great Britain. This was, again, it was prized land. It was a prized port. It was huge for shipping. This was a big deal. Um, and so up to the 1500s, the British were really, I mean, they, they ruled the roost. And the wines that were made in this region were made for the British palate. And that's important because this is before the age of discovery. This is a time in you know, human history where everyone largely stayed put. Yeah, you might sail up from Bordeaux up to London, 
that's probably the extent of your travels. You get too far beyond that, and bad things happen. You don't know where you're going. The world was very, very small. We get to the 1600s. We get to the age of exploration, where the Dutch actually were playing a huge role in colonization around the world. And the British and the French tend to have an adversarial relationship. They tend to get in some fights and bickers and squabbling, as you know, empires tend to do. Um, and the Dutch were very happy to take over in, in Bordeaux and take that leading role. Um, the Dutch were more concerned, instead about domestic consumption, the Dutch weren't really concerned about drinking wine at home. They wanted to make sure this wine could survive getting down to South Africa. They wanted to survive in, in the Caribbean. They wanted to survive going across oceans, where it became incredibly hot, where it was turbulent on the boat. Think about your ideal conditions for a wine cellar and do the opposite. The Dutch were concerned about this because they realized you didn't want to ship wine, have it leave Bordeaux and get to port, and be undrinkable. So they found that they just wanted to make wine that was durable. And these were called cargo wines. And the Girard, this was a, an organization that basically set the prices. And they placed value on this, uh, this area called the Palace, which when we talked about uh, saint Emilion, we talked about land that was low-lying near the river, very fertile, very good for growing grapes, not what we would consider high quality, not what we consider fine wine by today's standards, but this was put atop the pyramid of what the Dutch wanted. These were wines were a little bit more rustic, they were coarse, they were a little bit more tannic, they were ripe, they were, they were fine, but they were durable and they were made to go around the world. So this is why now we see, you know, in saint Emilion in Pomerol, a little bit of regression, because they decided to make this market decision based upon the Dutch rather than the British model. We can't forget about merchants, because merchants will all ha have always and will continue to play a large role without some major shakeup. Merchants Basically, because it was international trade, and you had chateaus that were so focused on making wine, making a quality product, they weren't worried about shipping it around the world. They weren't worried about finding consumers off in di distant lands. That was the merchant's business, like buying wine because they knew the end goal. They, they knew the, the marketplace that these wines were going to. So these merchants had an incredible amount of power because of this international wine trade. You didn't see this in a lot of other wine regions to this, at this point, certainly not in the 1600s, but because we were right on the Atlantic Ocean, a major shipping port not just in Europe, but also as the jumping off point going to the new world. Merchants were in power. So we look at this, and this, we're starting to see a little bit of the formation of now what we, we talked about in, or what we're going to talk about in 1855. Records had to be kept. One, for taxation. Two, because vintages changed. Three, because you wanted to make sure that 10 years ago a property was producing wine of the quality that you expect it to today. You wanted to make sure that both past and future were being aligned in the present. So they kept impeccable records. And Abraham Lawton was basically seen as kind of the godfather of this record keeping. Um, so you see the last name Lawton popping up. And then his, um, his son, Guillaume, um, in 1815. These records were pristine. You could go back and see exactly how much was paid for how many barrels going where. This was important because no one else was doing this other than these merchants. Tourism and guidebooks, they were starting to pop up. Yeah, we want to go to Bordeaux. Uh, you know, what should, you know, what should we see? What should we drink? Uh, you know, just starting to uh, begin, kind of begin their formation. And then visiting dignitaries, Thomas Jefferson being certainly one of the most famous um, to visit Bordeaux and really kind of put a, a stake in the ground saying, this is amazing stuff, pay attention here. You know, the, you know, the, the ambassador of uh, the United States, he came over, and, but there's a lot of myth and mystery around Thomas Jefferson's visit. Um, in a span of a week, he <coughs> came up with this comprehensive organization that it took generations of merchants to develop. A little bit of Jefferson's view. I mean, obviously, he was a big fan of wine. So again, we see Thomas Jefferson's perspective here. Huge fan of wine. You know, he was very much into the wine lifestyle. And if, if wine is cheap, then it's fantastic for a country because wine was thought of as you know, a beverage to celebrate and to create social intercourse and really just to celebrate the fact that you're alive. Um, that's really fantastic. And then he saw that like whiskey and beer and other things were, were they're bad. Um, you know, those are, those are bad for society. You, you can look at London and gin and things like that and be like, gin was the cause of all sorts of social tumult in London. Wine has never caused any problems. A bit of a romantic uh, view of wine, certainly. But again, you looked at what he, you look at what he purchased back in 1780s. Um, you know, these names are very, very familiar. These names are absolutely, you know, still to this day on the tip of all of our tongue. So again, now we are right on the precipice of 1855, and we're going to introduce one of the major players, and that's the Chamber of Commerce of Bordeaux. Um, their whole goal in life was to not disturb and upset anybody. 
their whole thing was about protecting the, the interests of the region, not the individual proprietors, not the individual winemakers, not the individual chateaus. Because if, they, if people saw the Medoc, if people saw Bordeaux as good, then that meant they saw all of Bordeaux as good. If they saw only Lafitte as good, then that means everyone else is on a second tier. So the Chamber of Commerce was all about kind of keeping everything as level as possible. Certainly they acknowledged there were higher quality players in the game, and there were some that were lower, but their whole thing was about status quo and trying to keep it that way for the long term. So we hear a lot about Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, who came in and basically ordered this, this expedition to take place. Incredibly, um, I want to say jealous, but wanted to outdo the British. Once again, that rivalry here. And the British had the expedition in London in 1851, and they, they, they displayed the Crystal Palace. Huge innovations in technology. Um, but the British were averse to showing off how much they spent on things. Kind of cheap like that. It's like, no, that doesn't matter how much we spend. Don't worry about it. So not a lot of records about British goods um, being displayed at the exhibition, whereas the French were like, our, we absolutely want to show off our price. Look at this. This is a great value. This is exceptional wine. This is an exceptional textile. We want you to know how much it costs. That way when you see it, and it's, a, it's maybe a better price or it's a higher price, you know that something might not be right there. Very much about transparency. Louis Napoleon was busy doing kind of you know, regal things and you know, kind of expanding the, the French influence, so he sent his cousin Napoleon, Jerome, uh, to go take over the exposition. Um, not a lot of wine experience, um, but the exposition wasn't about wine. It was about technological, about innovation and industry. That being said, the Giron was like, well, we're not a big industrial, I mean, sure, we have shipping and we have great things like that, but what are we known for? We're known for wine. We want to be show, we want to show that wine is actually a tech, our technological innovation because of our winemaking processes, because of um, the fact that we can get quality so frequently, so consistently. This was a big deal to them. They wanted to show that this is, this is still technology, even though it is an agricultural product, even though it is something you consume, not traditionally in the way of technology or in industry, but in a more personal manner. So you see the Giron kind of stepping up and saying, this is what we want to do. So the opinions on Giron wine were not necessarily um, all aligned like the Chamber of Commerce wanted it to be. Um, there were some differing opinions that were starting to come up. There were some people who were starting to you know, question these merchants because the merchants put down in their hierarchy uh, of pricing, uh, they, you know, they documented all this, so people started to say, oh, well, there's, there's, that, there's this hierarchy that's, that's basically ingrained in society. Um, this is how much the wines are supposed to cost. People started questioning that, and that was really upsetting um, to, to, to the Gironde, especially the Chamber of Commerce, because, again, their whole thing was to make everybody feel equal. Um, so what they were going to do is they were going to send a selection of all these wines off to Paris for the expedition with labels that were essentially created by the Chamber of Commerce, created to not show off anyone who was involved, only the property name and uh, the commune that was located. It was not about individuals, it was about the Gironde as a whole. It was about everybody displaying their wines and they put a giant map up there and they would show off this classification um, that existed based upon price. But this was just a snapshot in time. This was just the way the prices were in 1855. This was just based upon decades, even centuries, of research that these merchants were putting out there. So yeah, it was a snapshot, but it was based upon a lot of data. It's going to change. It has changed. Not all these prices were static. Vintage after vintage, you'd see Lafitte you know, way up here, but then Lafitte would come down. Um, so they realized that this was something that was just supposed to be about that day, um, that time, that, that year. Um, so again, it protected the brokers. It protected the merchants. These were big players. If you upset them, they didn't have an incentive to go off and sell all this wine, again, internationally. So you'd hurt your own commerce by upsetting the merchants. Um, and again, few key producers. Seems like uh, Latour is always um, kind of thumbing its uh, nose up at people, um, saying, we're going to do what we're going to do. They found that, we can't, what do you mean you can't put our label on the bottle? What do you mean we can't use our own label? Our label is who we are. You can't take away our identity. Sure, if you just put text that's like Lafitte, so what? We want to represent something better than that. We want to show off that we have a great manager. We want to show off we have a great owner. And this was the Chamber of Commerce like, no, 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 no. You can't do that. It's not about individuals. It's about the region. However, Napoleon Jerome, uh, in the whole kind of equality movement in France around that time, where you took away from, uh, you know, basically from regions, and it was more about individuals' work and their own self-worth, um, said that, you know, the workers should be recognized. The people who were involved on a day-to-day -day basis at these wineries should be recognized. So Lafitte decided that they were going to leave their wines in the Gironde display, but they're also going to have their own stand, just, just kind of down the aisle from the exposition. 
So you'd be walking by and you'd see this map and you'd see all the, you know, all the properties located there and you'd see the bottles of wine lined up and you'd say, okay, there's Lafitte, but there's also Margot and Latour. Um, but then you'd walk a couple feet down the, round, down the aisle and then there's a stand just for Lafitte. So again, there, this was hugely controversial because no other, there were a couple of other properties that finally caught on board. Um, the Americans helped in this because the Americans sent an underwhelming representation of um, industry over to the Universal Exposition. So there was a lot of space that they had in these wonderfully newly built exposition halls that were empty. So they were just trying to fill it. They were trying to just get people in there. So they said, Lafitte, yeah, sure, come on. You can get in here. And by the time it was all set up, you know, any sort of temper tantrum that was thrown by the representatives of the Chamber of Commerce, nothing could happen. It was already in place. They weren't going to take down a display when they were so desperate in need for uh, more people to show off. So again, it was about the Gironde, it was about the region, it was about the Medoc here. And they received the award of excellence. Um, you know, the quality of wines was exceptional. The wines were very impressive. Um, so the Chamber of Commerce was, well, yeah, we feel good about this. We, got, we, we, received our, we received basically the goal that we were looking for, and that's to show off our region as a whole. However, Lafitte also got its own certificate of recognition. So it kind of dulled down that, that joyous atmosphere the Chamber of Commerce felt because, well, wait a second, well, we're a region, but they still got, some, they got a participation as well. They got, they got exceptional wine recognized outside of the fact it's from the Gironde. Um, and this sets a standard that a lot of future writings, um, a lot of critics of the time, a lot of people who were trying to put into context Bordeaux as a, as a as region, um, it, it allowed them to kind of lob some grenades in their direction and say, you know what, this is, it's not necessarily everybody. There's certain producers that, that stand out, and we're going to celebrate those. Um, so it became really, really uh, problematic that a lot of people felt empowered to really upset the system. But that being said, there was only one, you know, basically one sanctioned classification. That was the one from the 1855 at the time, one from the Universal Exposition. So you had this kind of very, very delicate situation where the Chamber of Commerce was still pushing this because, well, it's the, it's the last real certification we have. It's the last recorded thing that went global, and it's going to help us de uh, deflect a lot of this criticism. So they were in a really interesting position because this actually started to ossify things. The Chamber of Commerce kind of un you know, unknowingly, through their kind of complicit acceptance of it, not necessarily shouting, that this, is, this is the way it should go, but like, this is the last official certification. They were giving it a stamp of approval. And that then led to um, really it being created as the official classification. So people would always now say, okay, well, you know, here's, here's what we want um, from the region, here's the top producers in this particular vintage, but here's still the classification. It always was appended at the end, that this is the official classification. So official was, you know, official became an official term because of the lack of resistance from that, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, why, but, okay, so just the Medoc here. Why not the Libournay? And that goes back to the Dutch. That goes back to the fact that the Dutch chose, uh, you know, basically the Libournay chose to pursue that Dutch market of distribution globally rather than the British market of domestic consumption. They wanted to be a big fish in that small pond rather than competing against all of Bordeaux for a spot on a dinner table in London or in a private club in London. They decided that was their goal. So for the next hundred years or so, their wines were generally thought of as coarse and rustic and not very appealing to people. But now you had this official classification across the river, so therefore if there's an official classification and there's nothing, well, I'm gonna go buy the classified wine or what you know, was classified in 1855 because it's certified that the wines were good. And the Libournay were left out of this. So for, you know, really until the early 1900s, uh, the Libournay wines were okay, they were fine, but they weren't really at that level that the left bank, that the Medoc was really operating at. Um, and to just show the ossification that's taken place, again, there's no law, there's no rule in the INAO that says that this is how the classification has to be. But only two changes have taken place, and one was almost immediately thereafter, and that was Chateau Cantemurle with Madame Villeneuve. Um, she didn't go through a lot of merchants at the time. She didn't go through brokers, so a lot of her sales were not recorded by Lawton or uh, Guillaume, uh, Guillaume or Abraham, um, but she sold internationally direct to consumer, you know, kind of in today's parlance. Um, but she basically said, well, wait a second, I got left out of this, this big classification scheme you guys came up with. Here are my records. Here are all my sales. And if you go back 25 years, 
I sold 10 barrels to this merchant that you haven't really gone and seen in a couple of years. So they went back to that merchant and said, yeah, Madame, Madame Villeneuve actually sold this wine and sold it for a price that put it above um, what the lowest fifth growth was classified at. So Cantemiral got grandfathered in 1856, and then actually in, uh, in Dewey Markham's book, there's a great picture of the classification, and then you can see in very, very small handwriting the addition of Cantemiral. Everything's done in an elaborate manuscript, and then Cantemiral gets kind of added at the bottom in, in pen. So it stands out. It's like, yeah, this was a big deal. Um, this was the first adjustment. Uh, 1970, uh, 1973, uh, as we might you know, probably know, uh, Mouton got elevated. Uh, from second growth to first growth. And this is after intense lobbying. This was after a lot of money being, you know, kind of thrown around. Um, so, but it w you could argue, sure, it was a bought ascension, but the quality was still there. The optics are bad, but the quality was there. Um, and it was that resistance to change which then was put into place. If this, was, if this happened in uh, 1873, that would, you know, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce would have been, sure, okay, we can change this maybe a little bit but they realized that might open the door to everybody wanting to change. So it's really, you can't win. The Chamber of Commerce got put into a bad situation where they couldn't, they could, they accomplished their goal, but they were defeated for the rest of time with this classification. Um, so that, you can kind of see how it's uh, not going anywhere. Um, so here's a quick overview. Um, you know, we're not gonna go through all of these, but I just wanna show uh, these slides on the classification as it stands today. Um, you know, again, some properties uh, have expanded their holdings since then, some have shrunken their holdings since then, but it doesn't matter because once you were in this, you, you were in it for good. Um, you could double your, the size of your holdings in, uh, in Saint, Saint Estef, but you'd still get to keep your classification. Um, you could you know, invest in winemaking. That was one of the quickest ways pre-1855 uh, to move your way up. Because if you improve your winemaking, if you invest in winemaking, if you invest in barrels, if you invest in the technology at the time, your quality is going to go up. The merchants are going to record that. Your sale price is eventually going to go up. It wasn't going to happen overnight. It's going to happen in 10 years, 15 years. Um, but that's, again, doesn't matter anymore. You can make the investments here and make better wine and try to push yourself in the discussion with first growth, but you're never getting there. Or you could just say, throw your hands up and say, nothing's going to change. We're just going to mail it in. We're just going to get away with what we can get away with because nothing's going to change. They're not going to demote us, and no one has been. So here's our third gross, and then fourth gross, and then we get into our fifth gross here. It's poor Chateau Lannison. Um, they were included in the original map. They were included in the original classification. They couldn't, they couldn't be bothered to send along six bottles of wine to the exposition, and forever got cut off from that fifth growth. It's like, oops. Someone in marketing got fired that day, probably. Um, but again, this is, you know, decisions made 162 years ago, 170 years ago, now are affecting the business of these wineries today. Is that right? Is that wrong? I don't know. Um, but here's, again, a perspective, um, a little, again, a little cynical. It's very easy to be cynical at something like this because, you know, it's not going to change anything, so you can say whatever you want about it. Um, but it's really about just saying, like, you know, here are some properties that are mailing it in. And then you have something by, you know, like Sociando de Malay, no rating but producing excellent wines. And probably if today's, if we were going to rewrite the classification today of the Medoc, that would be included. Um, so I, it's, it's tough. And then, you, know, you look at, you know, the fact that, you know, Petrus, and you look at Ozone and La Mission Oprion, these aren't classified properties. I mean, is anyone going to say that La Mission Oprion doesn't at least deserve to be on the same table as Oprion most of the time? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good wine, but it wasn't classified. In fact, none of these wines in the Grave were classified because Oprion kind of got grandfathered in because it had been around and been really pushing the forefront of quality winemaking and received international recognition for it. So the Gironde wanted Oprion really as its own. It's like, no, come with us, come with us. You're part of this team. Um, so again, this is a tough list, I apologize. I was, uh, but this is, if you go on LiveX, um, so Sauternes and Barsac, these are, these are often overlooked because they didn't receive as much pomp and circumstance at the Universal Exposition as the, the still red wines. Um, but that being said, these were classified as well in 1855. So it does go back. Um, it's all based upon the same criteria. It's based upon merchants. It's based upon value. Um, there was a big market for these wines back then. Um, it was you know, very much, uh, you know, I mean, Ikem back then was just as prized as Ikem today. Um, you think about what the bottle of 1811 Ikem goes for 
I think it's $117,000 right now if you can find it on auction. And that was, you know, 40 years old. You imagine what people were trying to, I mean, if it was that, it's still that good now, imagine how good it was back then. And this is a property that, again, was recognized for, for well in advance of the 1855 classification. But again, not to be forgotten, the fact that they're premier and deuxième cru classé in Sauterne. So now we jump across the river, finally. And it, it, it took a while, um, but it, it took 100 years for saint Emilion to really kind of get its organization together, get its act together, and say, you know, we're missing out on something. We're not able to market our wines very well. We're not able to get the message out there that we can produce quality wines. You know, back at the early you know, 1900s, the quality was starting to kick in. They were starting to realize, okay, we should probably make wines that are better than what we're punching at right now. Uh, we have better fruit. We have, we can, we are, we're, there's technology being shared. Um, again, the world's getting a little bit smaller, so we need, to, we need to step up our game. So in 1955, they created the saint Emilion classification. And this was based, again, upon, upon some loose pricing structures in place, but they, they came out with the caveat. They saw what happened in 1855. And they said, we're going to reassess this every 10 years or so, every 20 years or so. We, we don't want this to be a, you know, a stagnant uh, kind of stuffy document. We want it to be a living document that will continue to evolve and reward producers that are, are continuing to push higher and higher for their quality. Um, so, you know, 69, 85, 96, and 2012. Um, one tricky thing is that uh, you'll see Saint Emilion Grand Cru on bottles. And this is where I, I want to draw an important line because it's, it's a brilliant marketing ploy. Saint Emilion Grand Cru is actually an appellation, it's certified by the INAO. Um, and all it says is that, you know, for Saint Emilion Grand Cru, all you have to do is get to one degree of alcohol higher than Saint Emilion General. You have to age your wine longer at the chateau. And you know, now it's like, okay, well now we can put Grand Cru on it because it's supposed to be a better wine. Back, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, when it was harder to get grapes ripe, when the technology wasn't there to go out in the vineyard and manage disease and pests and things like that, sure, you, you would brag if you could get to 11.5% alcohol on some of your wines. Now it's 11.5, people just shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, that's if we harvest in July or August. We can get 11.5% in our sleep. Should an appellation be based upon that? I don't know, but the fact is, it can, is often confused with Saint Emilion Grand Cru Classe, which is the classification. So it's the difference between an appellation and a classification. Must say Classe if it's going to be talking about this classification. And you see the category. You know, what was it based upon? You know, it's it's based upon a blind tasting panel. You know, certainly you need to have back vintage history. It's not just what you did this vintage. It's like, oh, we're going to base this upon how you did in 2009 and 2010. Okay, sure. We also want to see how you did in 2004 and 2007 and 2008. Like, ooh, that's a little bit of a higher standard to get over. Sure. So that's 50% is how do your wines hold up over time to get into Class A. And then it's about your top topography, your winemaking, and your reputation. You know, are you known as a quality wine producer? Are you known kind of as a jerk that doesn't really do the right thing? You're cutting corners. How do your peers view you? How are you viewed around the world? So 20% is based upon your reputation. It's kind of an amazing thing that you know, we're actually going to take who you are as business people and factor it into whether or not you have earned this title of Grand Cru Class A. And if you want to be Premier Cru Grand, Grand, <clears throat> Premier Grand Cru Class A, it's a higher threshold again. More vintages, uh, more topo you know, basically more topography, but also a higher reliance on reputation. You can't sneak in to Grand Cru Class A, uh, Premier Grand Cru Class A. It's based upon, again, long-term history, based upon how you're viewed around the world. And that's pretty smart. I think that's a nice evolution from the 1855 uh, version in the Medoc. So here we have our classification as of 2012. There were two elevations to Grand Cru Class A A, and that's Chateau Angelou and Pavie. Um, here are Grand Cru Class A B. And again, this is not static. Um, there have been changes over the past 50 years. Um, then you get down into the, the Grand Cru Class A. Now you have 64. There are more Grand Cru Class A's in Saint Emilion than there are classified growths in the Haute Medoc, or, or in, the, in the 1855 Medoc. So is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Is this, is this too many for what's essentially kind of a pretty small region to have four and then 14 and then 64? I mean, you're talking over 80 producers now out of a region that's not that big. But again, it's supposed to be an evolutionary thing. However, the legal system has always been getting involved the past couple of years. 
There's this, um, again, kind of, if you're a winemaker and you all of a sudden get uh, demoted or almost even left off of the classification, God forbid, because you weren't doing the right thing, uh, there have been lawsuits based on this. You know, 2000, uh, 2006 was annulled because of lawsuits. And they said, no, 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 well, if you got promoted, you get to stay promoted. If you got demoted, we're going to eliminate the demotion. Like, well, that doesn't sound fair at all anymore. So this wonderful system you came up with now gets tied up in the legal system, gets tied up in courts. Um, will it sort itself out? Probably not, because we're talking about big money now. In the global market, now with wine going to China, wine going all over the world, these matter more than ever. So it's uh, still, it's kind of tricky. It's kind of a difficult uh, kind of land to navigate. Here's the same thing, 2017 classification for the right bank. Um, so up at the top, we see Petrus, 18, almost 19,000 uh, pounds for a case. That's you know, first, first growth you know, without question. Um, but also Le Pen. Le, Pen, you know, Le Pen's a fairly new, you know, new winery. You know, it's the Garagis. It's, uh, I think, was it 79 was the first vintage of Le Pen. And it's at 16,000 pounds. So that's, I mean, obviously first growth. I mean, you have a whole bunch that, you know, again, there's a lot of flexibility here. And you see it's, it kind of comes into play. It's like, yeah, these are, these are the top producers. These are what people are paying for. So maybe, maybe it should be based on price. Maybe it should be based on reputation. But then if we're going to talk about that, we've got to talk about ratings and things like that. Um, we're going to talk quickly about Grave often overlooked. You know, Grave was, uh, the whole region of the Medoc used to be known as Grave. Uh, it was a big encompassing area because there was, you know, as we, we talked about in seminar two, there's a lot of gravel in the soil throughout the left bank. But Grave really has the greatest concentration of it. Um, and they decided to do a classification as well. 16 properties, um, 13 for red, nine for wine, uh, so for white. And two are now not even in existence, <laughs> but they're still classified which seems strange, but this is, again, this is a choice to make a system that is static, that is not going to change. So when a winery gets, um, you know, kind of basically bought or used for a, a second label uh, for another property, somehow that wine still gets to keep its classification, even though it's no, it's not, you won't find a current vintage of either, you know, Latour Oprion or La Vie Oprion. But it's still classified. It's, you know, people are still going to go out looking for it, which, in my opinion, makes it prime for counterfeit. It's like, oh, I want to buy a classified growth. Great, here's one. They don't know the property doesn't exist. All they can do is point to the classification of 1959 and go, yeah, this is classified. Enjoy. It's problematic. No matter how, I mean, all, even when you think you're doing the right thing, there are loopholes uh, to be to, you know, kind of to get through. So here's the classification of Grave. You will see some carryover. Some properties are classified for both white and red. Some are red only. Some are white only. Yeah, I, think it's, I think this is good. You know, the white wines are far more important here in Grave. Um, you know, I think you know, some of the white wines of Grave are some of the best white wines of the world. Um, they deserve to be celebrated. They deserve to be kind of up there with the top wines. You know, are these wines you know, as good as you know, the, 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 you know, the first gross of the, the Madoc? Depends on perspective. Um, there's some great values here. I know you can buy current vintage of some of these wines for under $100 a bottle, well under $100 a bottle. The whites, you know, $40, $50, $60 a bottle. I like that. I like that price point. I like that area. Just make sure you buy one that isn't defunct. This is a really cool slide that Eric uh, sent to me. And this is basically uh, your classification, uh, price per case, and Parker rating. Maybe this is how we should base our classifications. I mean, you, you can see a correlation here that, you know, sure, the higher points you get, then the higher the price. I'm still waiting for the first 103-point Parker score. I'm convinced it's going to happen one of these days. Because 100 is just, it's just not high enough for this wine. It's amazing. So it's 103. Um, but then you look. I mean, some of these are based, you know, you know, price, score, and then you see the classified. These tend to be the outliers. These tend to be the ones that stand above it. Because not, now you're not just buying based upon rating. You're buying based upon the prestige. So that even bumps you up further. Because this kind of mass, you know, who can remember what a fourth, you know, all the fourth gross out there, or fifth gross. Um, but Margot, yeah, we know what that is. We're going to pay more for that. So again, you can kind of see the correlation. You know, score matters. So maybe we've got to base it upon score. So now we jump into two of the lesser known terms, Cru Bourgeois uh, being the first. And this was 444 properties in 1932. That doesn't seem legitimate to me. I mean, it's, everybody come on into the tent. 
sure, come on in. We're, we got this new, new thing. It was meant to be an extension of the 1855 classification, though. So even though it seems kind of clumsy uh, to launch with well over 400 wineries as something that's legitimate and you can rely upon for quality, it was meant to be kind of for the people that missed the cut in 1855. This was supposed to be the, the kind of the carry-on of that, you know, rewarding people um, who are still pushing the envelope, who are still making better wine, who are never going to get into the, that, the, uh, the Medoc classification, um, but should be celebrated somewhere. So they cut it down to 247 in 03, which is still a lot. You know, that's more than... Uh, that's more than your Saint Emilion and your Medoc classifications together, and Grave and Sautern. Um, and again, lawsuits. It seems like any, any decision that gets made that's going to reward people for doing the right thing gets thrown into courts by people who are just, I don't know, too lazy or have the money to challenge these things. Um, but they reintroduced it again. There, was, there were two categories that got dropped, Exceptionnel and Superior. So now it's just Cru Bourgeois as a whole. Uh, and then every five years, it gets reviewed. Not as prestigious, so it doesn't get a lot of uh, kind of resistance as you would find some of the other more prestigious classifications, but this might be the future. This might be, you know, in 40 years, uh, the classification system that now means something, now means, you know, it now evolves on a regular basis. Maybe Cru Bourgeois starts to, win, you know, somehow they get a fifth growth to join in. Maybe they get one of those properties, because I don't think there's any law that says you can't be part of Cru Bourgeois and and a, and a classification of the Medoc. So maybe they can find a way to kind of link forces, give it a little bit more kind of justification and, and uh, reason for existence, and then all of a sudden this starts to mean a little bit more on the market. Because right now it's still kind of amorph uh, amorphous and ambiguous. But here's a list of all uh, 260 of them. It's a lot. But again, you can find some great wines in here. You know, you got to kind of squint and, and read the fine print. You know, if you're going to go through and taste all 260 of them, you know, that's some hard work. But there's some great wines um, at that level. And then Cru Artisan, uh, something, again, you don't see a lot here in the United States. You have to, it's mainly to reward small-scale wineries that do a lot, of, a lot of their sales locally in Bordeaux or, or domestically in France. Um, you will find some that do make it across, uh, across the Atlantic. Um, but this is, you know, these were basically people who were involved in, you know, kind of artisanal projects of their own, but still manage wineries because they're still part of life and culture. So I think these are really fun uh, to study because, you know, it really is about a passion. This isn't, you know, it often was, it certainly was not their only source of income, maybe not even their primary source of income, but they had vineyards. They made wine because they, they just loved to do it. So they came up with this classification, uh, again, since the mid-1800s, um, formal certification in 2002. You won't see a lot of it here. Um, but it's something that's very, very cool. And the wines have to come from, from these particular communes. So you won't find it really, um, you won't find it anywhere outside of that. So here's a list of the crew artisans. So if you see one of these, you know, it's you know, certainly in terms of you know, academic uh, pursuit and always educating yourself, they're, they're great to try. And they do tend to be, you know, they can be really, really delicious. Um, they can also be a little bit more rustic and coarse, but that being said, they're, it's, it's about celebrating a lifestyle. It's about celebrating more culture for this. What the future is for it, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if it gives a whole lot of value to a bottle of wine that you're, that you're in a shop and you're like, oh, Crew Artisan. This is going to be you know, a life-changing wine. I want to sell this for 20 years. You know, it's, I think it's just more about, I, want, I, want to, I just want to buy a, a, a good bottle of wine and reward some people for doing the right thing and doing some hard work out in the vineyard. So, now that we've looked at all the classifications, now it's a little quiz time. So we're going to flash up on here a label, and we're going to shout out classification. Where does it come from? And what classifications does it fall into? Or classifications, or no classifications. So we all know what we own. What's the classification? First growth. And? Absolutely. So it has two particular. I think my battery's dying here. First growth and Grand Cru Classe of Grave. So it's one of the few carryovers that you'll see here. Certainly Grave has red and white carryover, but it's the only one that bridges both of these. This is, I think this will be precedent for you know, possibly Cru, Cru Bourgeois merging with some other uh, classifications to get a little bit more legitimacy. lynch -Bage. Fifth growth. In which commune? Excellent. We're all paying attention. Premier Grand Cru Classe A, 2012 saint Emilion classification. Unclassified Pomerol, yes, absolutely. Again, Pomerol, it's, it's a unique circumstance. I didn't, I didn't have it up on any of the slides because there's no classification. Pomerol was a latecomer to the game. Really, the Pomerol wine industry 
the 1950s, 1960s really got the engine started. And this was a time of the world expanding in terms of wine consumption. So they're starting up and like, well, we can go through all the trouble. We watched this all happen across the river. You know, Saint Emilion, I think you're going to have some problems of your own. Um, you know, we, don't, we just don't have the time to invest in that yet. Um, you know, maybe our quality level still isn't there. By the time you know, 1990s come around, now Palmerol's on fire. Everybody wants it. It's like, well, classification, who needs it? We got, we got some of the most expensive wines in the world right now. Why, do, why would we want to put handcuffs on you know, some properties that are you know, punching above their weight or are getting more money than they possibly deserve? So they, they just didn't even bother going down that road. Maybe they will in the future, but I think it's uh, pretty unlikely. Cru Bourgeois. You could actually read the, you could read the fine print. <laughs> um, yeah, so Cru Bourgeois, again, you know, fantastic wine. Delicious wine. Um, but, but are you going to go out and say, you know, I'm going to walk into a, a shop or I'm going to go online and looking for some seller selections um, and buy a Cru Bourgeois? Maybe not, but maybe it's worth you know, putting them into the conversation of you know, some things that could sell her for five years or ten years and really start to celebrate, again, the entire realm of Bordeaux wines, not just the classified growth. Because, again, it's easy to, to buy classified growth. It's hard to go find little gems like this. Fifth growth in the Madoc, absolutely. Fantastic. So you guys are good. Classified Grave, white and red. Very good. So again, kind of knowing what, um, what, you know, where the wines come from is half the battle. Unclassified, that's right. Okay, so that is one of the quirks is that classified growths are only the first wines. Second, wa second labels are not included in that classification. No matter how good this wine is, it's not a classified growth. It can command prices. That certainly would challenge many classified growths, but it will never be, it's not classified at this point um, until they put in some sort of um, kind of new labeling system that allows second growths to go in. So finally, we get to the point where we actually get to taste. This is the reward for, uh, for getting through all of this. So again, we'll look at our grape variety profiles. We'll look at all of this. Um, you know, just a good sense of what these grapes bring to the table. Um, and most everything, uh, you'll see the breakdown of all the wines on the slide as well as on the papers in front of you. Um, and we can, we can go back to this in time, but let's, uh, let's start tasting through. So in glass number one, yeah, oh, quick, actually, yeah, good time for questions. So we need our microphone right here with Eric. My question has to do with this phenomenon I've observed. Uh, whereby the classified growths in the Medoc mm -hmm. can acquire more and more land mm -hmm. and still have the same classification. Yes. So presumably, Terroir had something to do with him getting the original classification, mm -hmm. but nobody stops them from doubling or tripling their size by buying additional land. And the, the, the land they buy doesn't even have to be contiguous Absolutely. to the original uh, awarded uh, sector. Right, it, it, and it seems as though that kind of the way forward, and unless things change, that the way forward is not terroir driven, it's producer driven, it's know-how, it's knowledge, it's experience, and that, you know, it's certainly, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the Burgundian model of who, you know, where is the land rather than who owns the land. And yeah, is it right that they can buy a piece of property that has basically been left kind of you know, fallow or untended for generations and all of a sudden that becomes first growth property or first growth vineyard? No, I don't think that's right. But I, I also real, I think that the argument is these, these chateaux are very, very good at business and they realize their image is everything. And if they were to make a decision that would put their image down below the other first growths or for a second growth to be put themselves quality wise below the other second growths, I think that helps to prevent unscrupulous behavior like just buying up land and producing all the wine they can. Because again, if the more wine you put out there, eventually your price is going to come down. Eventually you're going to reach a point in the market where supply is going to outweigh demand. And all of a sudden your price is going to crash and you're going to have wine sitting on, in your cellar, which they don't want. They don't want to have stocks and stocks of wine that then they can't sell to the market. So it's, it is a problem, absolutely. And have land decisions been made based upon just trying to take advantage of it? Absolutely. Um, but I'd like to think that there is a kind of honor among thieves, if you will, um, that they're going to do the right thing, that they're going to just basically kind of say, you know what, we got, we got to make sure that the quality level stays the same. Um, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. 
But excellent question.